Good morning. I hope your week has gone better than mine. How many, we, how many out there, how many of your week went better than mine? Probably more of you should be raising your hand, but that, that's all right. <clears throat> hey, you know, we start off this new year, and, and New Year Caesar's always filled with hope, right? And that's why uh, a lot of people do New Year's resolutions, you know, and, and for some of us, you know, it's not a matter of coming up with new ones. It's just a matter of changing the date from 2015 now to 2016. And maybe you've got this long list that maybe goes back years and years, you know, it's just kind of updating those things. And, and you know, maybe, maybe it's no longer about, you know, losing weight. Maybe it's simply about trying not to lose motivation. But, you know, as we start a year, it's sort of that hopeful part, the idea of fresh start and new beginnings, and maybe this is the year. And, but sometimes there's these curveballs that get thrown into our life. And uh, sometimes it seems like they just pile one on top of another. And if you're a, a person of faith, sometimes your question is, why? Why, God? Why are you allowing this to happen? You ever ask that question? You know, and, and if you're not a religious type, maybe you're kind of here today just checking this whole thing out. You've asked the question of why. You know, why does this stuff always seem to happen? And we try to come up with explanations. And sometimes for those of us that are, that are believers in God, that, those of us that are followers of Jesus, we have some, some mental exercises we go through to try to explain those things. And we have some theories about, you know, you know, if you just commit your life to God, everything will be perfect. You know, at least that's what we want to believe. You know, if, if Jesus is in my life, you know, and I lift him high, everything's going to work out just peachy keen. Forgetting that sometimes peaches aren't keen, they're rotten, right? And so today we're going to look at a passage of Scripture that, I, that, from my perspective, is one of the most helpful I've ever found as I wrestle with this whole idea of why. Why does this happen? Why does that happen? And where is God in all of those moments of asking why? And so before we jump into it today, I want to just ask you to bow your heads and, and invite you to pray along with me, okay? Lord, I long for not just a new start of this year. I long to enter this year with motivation and hope and positiveness. But at times there's, other, there's stuff that happens. And sometimes it's just, it's just the wiring. It kind of drops us down. And sometimes it's hard to see beyond that. But today I simply ask for myself and those others maybe in this room or those watching online someplace around this world that are at this moment not worried about losing their weight or fattening their wallet but are just worried about losing the motivation and their hope. For those of us that find ourselves in that place, I just ask that you would, you would speak to us through words that were said and written thousands of years ago, that even today are fresh and new. Even today can help us make sense out of our lives. And so we invite you into this space, into this place, and more importantly, into our conversation and our thoughts. And we ask today again that we can leave this place with hope. And with a better understanding of you and ourselves. In your name, amen. Hey, we're going to pick up the story over in Mark chapter 4. <clears throat> Setting is a pretty simple one. It's probably like a lot of days that Jesus had. He's, he's been teaching and he has gone out and taught and preached and for those of you who never taught or preached in front of a group, you know, uh, you do it long enough, it just kind of wears you out. At the end of the day, you're kind of wiped out. And so Jesus has, has done this, and he's actually had a little side discussion with his disciples because they, as so often happens for them, have come back to Jesus and said, we have no clue what you're talking about. And Jesus said, okay, guys, let's, let's go through the points here. Here's what the sower is. Here's what the seed is. And he works through there, and that's where we're set. It's sort of getting to the end of the day after this long day of teaching, and here's where we pick up the story. It says, that evening, Jesus said to his followers, let's go across the lake. And if you follow the story of Jesus much, and if you haven't, I invite you to you know, go to a book like Mark or Matthew or Luke or John, and you'll, you'll discover some great stories there about Jesus' life, but you'll find this pattern. Oftentimes, Jesus is here, and all of a sudden, he says, let's leave this place. Let's go way over here, because either things have gotten so busy, or you know, people, the crowds have started to gather. And Jesus was not about big crowds, even though we think he was about crowds. He's really about helping people. When the crowds kind of get too big, he says, let's go to a different spot. 
And so this night he says, hey guys, let's get in the boat and let's go across the lake. And Mark says, he records the story, says they left the crowd behind him. They, they took him in the boat. Jesus is in the boat. In fact, he's been teaching from this boat. They just set out. And there are other boats with him, so they are not alone out on this lake at night. But they're, they're, they're pretty confident. Um, this, this lake, this, the Sea of Galilee here is this, this um, it actually sits about 700 feet below sea level. And it's fairly close, about 30 miles or so away from this, this mountain range that, that goes up to almost, almost 10,000 feet. And so there's a, this 10,000 foot, roughly this 10,000 foot drop between these two. And so they get storms. But they're not worried because they have three seasoned fishermen in the boat. And if you're familiar with them, you know their names. Their names are Peter, James, and John. There we go, yeah. So we get some of the big here. And these guys are seasoned fishermen. And if you've ever been around seasoned fishermen telling their stories, you know, the fish was... And it was huge, you know, and, and the catch was great today. And, but they would have known how all these storms, when they come up, how to handle them. So they're out in this boat, and it says a very strong wind came up on the lake. And again, they're okay with that because this is what they've spent their life doing. So no worries. We'll just kind of keep rowing, and we're going to be fine. But the strong wind comes up, and then it says the waves began to come over the sides and into the boat, so that was nearly swamped. To which even if you're a seasoned fisherman, I have to think you, I have to imagine you go like this. Oh, no, right? Because now water's getting in the boat, and that's not where water's supposed to be. Water's supposed to be outside of the boat, right? So I don't know where they're, they're bailing, they're paddling, they're, they're trying to get this water to the boat. They're in the middle of this lake, this terrible storm's going on. And Mark tells us also, Jesus was in the boat, but he was at the back of the boat, sleeping on a cushion. Which is interesting. Jesus must have been really tired that day, right? Because there's waves. I mean, if the, if the waves are big enough to come inside the boat, you have to imagine waves are enough to, to move the boat up and down and around and around. This wind's blowing. It's a crazy scene. But Jesus is so exhausted that he is sound asleep in the boat. And then Mark says, they, the, the disciples are in the boat with him. They wake him up and they say to him, Teacher, don't you care that we are drowning? Don't you care that we are perishing? And the reality is, those words, don't you care? Those are questions and those are words and thoughts that every follower of Jesus has asked at some point. Don't you care? Don't you care that the wheels are coming off? Don't you care that this relationship is falling apart? Don't you care that my business is going bust? Don't you care that my schoolwork, you know, I, it's, it's too much and I can't get the grades and it's just going to fail? Don't you care? And the implication behind that is clear. You must not care because you are asleep in the boat and we're drowning here. At least get a bucket and help us bail, right? And the disciples' belief is if you loved us, we wouldn't go through this. Right? I mean, Jesus, you're in the boat. If, if you loved us, we would not be almost drowning here. And our belief is very similar. If you loved us, we wouldn't, right? God, if you loved us, we wouldn't be failing at this. If you loved us, this would be working out. If you really cared about us, our kids wouldn't be having these issues. We wouldn't be having these issues. And the crazy thing is, how Jesus responds. I'm going to let it hang there for a second because this is that dramatic pause. Because haven't we thought that? Haven't we experienced that? God, if you loved us, this wouldn't happen. I mean, I was told from when I was a kid, if you've been around a church your whole life, you know, Blessings and curses. Just do these things and God will do these things, right? And I've done those things and he doesn't seem to be doing his stuff. And as they stand in this boat, looking at Jesus, saying, don't you care? If you really cared, this would not be happening. Jesus says, that's not true because I'm wet just like you. Everybody in the boat's wet, because if this wind is blowing like it describes, the water's coming over the sides of this boat. Everybody in that boat is soaked. And Jesus stood up, it says. And he commanded, as he rep <clears throat> reprimanded, that he's rebuked the wind and said to the waves, said to the sea, quiet, 
be still. Now I want you to notice something. Jesus does not stand up and say some magic words. He does not stand up and say, in the name of God, my Father. Jesus simply stands up and says to the wind and says to the water, quiet. Be still. And in the simpleness of those three words, Jesus conveys something to his disciples that they were not ready for. And he conveys something to us that I think we're always ready for. Because we long, for some of us in this room right now, we long for Jesus to speak in their life, quiet, be still, to the stuff that's going on, right? Quiet to all those voices around us. Be still to our heart. And the wind stopped. Paid attention, Caesar. And it became completely calm. <clears throat> now you can read this passage and think, oh, he's talking about the wind. But he's talking about two things. He's talking about the wind stops. When he says it's completely calm, he's talking about the water. And if you've ever been around water, you know exactly what hit the disciples at that moment. That this was more than just simply Jesus saying stop and it stops. Jesus stopped everything. How many of you have ever been on a boat, you know, and, and, and seen the waves go to the, the, the uh, shore? You guys seen that, right? Thank you. About half a dozen of you. Thank you. I'm glad you've been in the water. The rest of you need to get on the water, get out more often, you know. Be a great idea. <clears throat> but you know, if, if, you, if you ever kind of watch, you know, the waves go to the shore and then they kind of bounce back, but they're smaller. And there's this, and if you've ever been before a storm and after a storm on a lake or any kind of body of water that's enclosed like that, you'll know, you can tell a storm's coming because the waves start to get bigger. And as the storm leaves, the waves still last. And they can last for a long time after that. But as Mark recounts this story, often to, and a lot of people think that Mark is simply getting a secondhand story from Peter, who was telling it firsthand. He's writing these words down. That as Peter recalls this situation, he says, the wind stops. And the waves stop. So this is more than just simply some words and stopping the thing and letting it kind of finish out. This is a stopping it. Everything becomes calm. And it's a reminder again that not only does Jesus have power, but Jesus is power. Because if you can say stop and physics stop, you got something going on, right? And then Jesus asked this question. Why are you afraid? And he, I love this question. Because I'm thinking like, well, duh. <laughs> oh, I mean, I'm standing here. I'm soaked. He's soaked. He's soaked. Jesus, even you are soaked. Because this, this has been a crazy storm. We're all soaked. It seemed like we were going down. It's obvious why we were afraid, right? I mean, why would you ask that question, Jesus? I mean, it's obvious. We're afraid because we thought we were going to drown while you slept. And how many times have you experienced that in your life? That you cried out to God. That you were afraid of what was going on. And it felt like God was asleep. Or absent. So guys, why are you afraid? Then he asked this very interesting question. <clears throat> Do you still have no faith? And the word here, faith, is this great word in the Greek that actually is a word that we don't have in English. Because faith there means not only faith, like, oh, I have faith in something, but it's the idea of belief. It's the idea of trust. It's like the stool. How many of you believe the stool can handle my weight? I'm not that heavy, by the way. Everybody raise your hand, all right? Help me out here, all right? <laughs> I did lose weight last year, Jesus. So I'm good, right, Dave? So we, we, we believe it. Now, now, we have faith in that, right? It looks pretty solid. I actually checked be, behind stage earlier. I, I made sure I got one that wasn't too rickety. But let me ask you an important theological question. 
at this moment, as I stand here, is our collective faith and belief in this chair doing me any good? That's right. The answer is no, right? But here's the other part of that word. It's not only faith, it's not only belief, it's the idea of trust. It's when I sit on it, and when I sit on it all the way. And Jesus asked them, do you still have no trust? No, put your full weight on it, trust kind of thing. Because in, in English language, we parse this whole thing, right? Right, Mike, we kind of, I, I, I believe something, yeah, I believe that's true. Doesn't make any difference to me, but I believe it's true, you know? But you, can, you have kind of faith, and we, we describe faith a little bit deeper. You know, faith is, yeah, I have faith in that. But for us, trust is, is a whole different thing. But in this language, in the original language, that's all three of those things. And so Jesus asked them, hey, guys, why are you so afraid? Duh. But, but do you still have no faith? Because he says, you have no reason to panic because I'm in the boat with you. So if we're going to drown, we are drowning together. And the reason Jesus sleeps is not simply because he's tired. And he is tired. He's exhausted. But he sleeps because he has faith, he has belief, he has trust. That because he's in the boat, that his father's in the boat as well. And no matter what happens, God is there. See, it's not the quality of your faith that saves you. Somebody ought to write this down or take a picture. This is the good part, all right? It is not the quality of your faith that saves you. It is the object of that faith. See, we say to ourselves, my faith isn't strong enough to do this. It has no question about how strong your faith is. It's about what that faith is in. Imagine you're, you're at a cliff. You're out for a walk on a warmer day than today, all right? You come along this kind of a little cliff there. You slip and you fall down that cliff. You're rolling along, and you see a branch that's sticking out from the side of the mountain. It's coming up pretty quickly. In fact, we have to do this real fast because by now we'd already passed it. But imagine with me, your brain's really working good. You, you, see, that, you see that branch sticking out of, the, out, of, out of the hillside. At that moment, do you know that that, that branch will save you? No. Yeah, no, right? Do you reach out and grab that branch? And you know why you reach out and grab it? Because you've got to grab something, right? But it's not, it's not the quality of your faith. It's not, you don't know if it's going to hold you or not, but you've got to do something. And it's really the object of that faith. That object of faith, that branch, you're going to reach and grab it because you're hoping that it will hold you. And when it does hold you, you are going to be thankful. Even though you hang there for hours, yelling, help, help, waiting for somebody, a helicopter, a dog, you know, wander by, and run, run and get its owner, you know, a lassie kind of thing. One of the things we can forget as followers of Jesus is that faith is not a virtue. It's a gift. And it's not about me getting enough faith. That's why Jesus talks about this. You know, if you had the faith like this little mustard seed, you can do amazing things. He's not talking about the quality of the faith. He's talking about what our faith is in. And I love how this concludes. Mark, as he hears from Peter, this is how, how the story ends. Jesus said these great words. Why are you afraid? You know, where's your trust? Where's your faith? You know, everything's calm now. Everything's cool now. And they were, they, were, they were afraid before, and now they are very afraid. They are terrified, and they ask each other, who is this? Right? Who is this that even the wind and the waves, that is the sea, obey him? Because they they, they've been hanging around Jesus for a while. This is, this is fairly early, if, if Mark is written in chronological order. This is fairly early in their experience with him. But they have believed that he's something special. They believe that he's maybe this Messiah, this, this long for hope for dream of the, of the Jewish people. But they had no belief. There was nothing, no belief system in, in Judaism that the Messiah would be divine, that the Messiah would be God himself. 
And all of a sudden now, they think to themselves, oh, baby. It's actually in the Greek. Oh, baby. <laughs> I mean, they're, they're terrified. What? Who is this? Because who are you going to meet that can tell the wind, quiet, and the waves, be calm, be still, and they respond? Just for fun, next time you're in a big storm, <laughs> just go out front. Just go out front. You don't even, no one's put a jacket on when there's a snowstorm. Just go out there and say, quiet, be still, and see what happens, right? <laughs> because what they have recognized is something that we all need to recognize, and that is that Jesus is, an unimagin is as unmanageable as the storm. They recognize that Jesus' power is Jesus' power. And the storms is uncontrollable, and it's unmanageable, and if Jesus can control it, then his power is unmanageable and uncontrollable. And sometimes we forget that. We get so comfortable with that Jesus is going to come through. He's on our side. And forget that sometimes what he plans for us is different from what we plan for ourselves. And whenever we recognize that in our experience with him, we end up like the disciples, terrified. Because when things don't go like we think they ought to go and plan and we think it's God's plan and things go in a different direction, it's easy to forget that Jesus is unmanageable as the storm. But there's a good side to that. See, the storm is just unmanageable. It has no feelings towards you. Even though at times if you've been in a bad storm, you think, oh, why are you doing this to me? It has no feelings. It is not picking on you. It's just picking on everybody, right? The difference is, the, the, the storm has no feelings towards you, but Jesus has an abundance of feelings towards you. And his love towards you is uncontainable. And because it's uncontainable, that's why his power is unmanageable by you. Because if you believe he can control all these things, then you have to believe that he knows stuff that you don't know. And you have to believe that what he has planned for you or what he needs for you to do or, or to go on in your life may not make sense to you. But to recognize, if you were a follower of Jesus, that he is right there with you, that he is in the boat with you. So if your feet get wet, your face gets soaked because the storm is hitting life, that does not mean that he's abandoned you. That does not mean he's not with you. It just simply means you don't have a stinking clue what's going on. And that's where we need to trust. And to believe that if he can control these things that nobody can control, then he can control things that nobody can control. And I say that because I want to speak specifically to those of you that are kind of in your 20s, maybe early 30s. Um, those of you that grew in this great generation, this millennial generation. You know, and you grew up at this great time with all this hope. You were told when you were a kid you could be anything you wanted to be. An astronaut, president of the United States, VITCOM billionaire, whatever your parents kind of told you, you know, and your teachers, and you got, you know, you got your awards for every participation because everybody, you know, gets an award. And maybe as we start this year, you find yourself kind of in that, in that spot. And here are, there are at least, at least five feelings that, that can overwhelm and disillusion us, specifically millennials. I actually saw this list uh, a few weeks ago when I put it in for this sermon. But I think it speaks to all of us, but specifically to those of you that are sort of in this, in this 20s to early 30s range. And see if these don't resonate. Here are five of the feelings that can overwhelm and disillusion us. Number one, disappointment. And disappointment sounds like this. 
I thought things would be better. I thought I would be better. And maybe the whole statement is this can't be all there is. And for some of you, you or somebody else has oversold your future to you. And you are not an astronaut. And you are not President of the United States. And you may be doing a job that you did not go to school for. You may be asking, would you like fries and a large drink with that? And that's disappointing. And that weighs heavy. Maybe it's not disappointment. Maybe the other feeling is despondency. Maybe, maybe it goes like this. I'm just not as happy as I used to be. You know, you wish for those days when you were a kid. So you got something just by showing up, you know, a little gold star, a little juice bar, it's all good. I feel fundamentally unable to feel any joy. And it just kind of weighs on you, this whole despondency. It just, uh, just, I don't feel like I can feel what I really need to feel. And the words that can describe you are these heavy, weary, vapid, Great word, by the way. Unaroused. In a purely non-sexual way. You know, just kind of flat. Another feeling, the third feeling is despair. Yeah, we all feel it, but sometimes you in this age category really feel it. You know, nothing I do matters. You know, I try to get ahead here, take these classes there, apply over here, but it doesn't seem to matter. I'm going to be stuck here forever. That black hole, you know? Doing a job I didn't go to school to do, and now I'm doing enough that I got enough bills that I got to stay here because that's all I can do. <laughs> all of my friends are doing so much better than I'm doing. This is the blessing of social media, by the way. <laughs> and everybody posts these pictures of them doing crazy stuff. You know, or great stuff, or stuff, stuff. You know, you don't know that they're standing in front of somebody else's house or somebody else's car, but it looks great. <laughs> looks great at the moment, right? Because they want you to know that they're doing better than they are. Whether it's the rejection letters that you've already gotten, or maybe that are already in the mail for this week, or the romantic breakups. Maybe it's the, you know, grandparents or your parents' death. You know, all these things that kind of just give you despair that, Life is just not working out the way you want it to, and it's not going to work out the way you want it to. Maybe it's doubt. You know, the church doesn't understand the stuff I'm struggling with, so we threw off the church. I'm not sure that God exists, and if he does, I don't really care. And here's the, here's the crazy thing, for this, specifically for this generation. Doubt has been crowned the new king. We doubt everything, because... That's, that's the thing. We begin to think, change how we think. You know, we think of, you know, Jesus is going to return, and now it's, remember that one time when, you know, we kind of think back, you know. And doubt hangs in this generation. Dissolution. You know, I haven't felt God in a really long time. This feeling like I'm just, there's nothing there, or I feel all alone. If you look at the statistics, the diagnosis of depression keeps getting ratcheted up higher and higher and higher. There's lots of causes for that, lots of explanations for that, but a lot of it is this whole feeling of, feeling of loneliness, you know, this idea of alone, therefore, alone forever, therefore, for helpless. And for those of you in this age bracket that are feeling these things, you should resonate with the story that Mark wrote that happened to Jesus and the disciples in that boat. Because you have asked that question. God, don't you care? Don't you care that she broke up with me? 
Don't you care that I got laid off? Don't you care that my student loan is crazy and I'm not even doing the job that I wanted to do so I could pay off that crazy loan? God, don't you care? I love this quote by Lucille Ball, a great theologian, by the way. <laughs> not everything that is faced can be changed. But nothing can be changed until it is faced. So maybe this year is the year that you can face those things. The despair, the despondency, the doubt, any of those kinds of things. So here, let me just kind of close today by what, what do we do? What do we do when we kind of feel this stuff? What do we do when we ask God, God, don't you care? If you love me, this wouldn't happen. When we have all those kind of feelings, what can we do? And let me give you just a, a few solutions, suggestions. Number one, engage the truth. To engage the truth that Jesus is in the boat with you, but that does not prevent everybody from getting wet. The times doesn't prevent everybody from drowning. To choose belief. Because it's so easy with all those D words and all those feelings to, to feel like, I'm just going to go this way. But to choose belief. When, the, when those moments come when you could say, I could do this, I can do that, and there's reasons to do this or that, to pull yourself back from the doubting side, from the, the, the going away side to the, to the belief side. To believe better about Jesus and yourself. And the better part about Jesus is you cannot figure him all the way out. And that's actually good. Because some people in this room right now are banking on the Redskins winning tonight. <laughs> and some people in this room are, betting on, are, are, are praying for the Packers to win tonight. The reality is some people are going to be disappointed after, actually tomorrow, actually, yeah, it's tomorrow. There's other games tonight. And if things always went the way you wanted them to go, it means that they would not go the way somebody else wants to go. That's why we need somebody bigger, stronger, wiser, figuring all this stuff out. And to believe better about Jesus. To believe the fact that not only was he in that boat, not only did he have the power to stop it all, and, and, and to kind of experience that storm and calm that storm, he actually goes to the cross, faces the biggest storm anybody has to ever face, because it's not just about dying for him, it's about carrying the weight of everybody's sin that's in this room, that's driving around us today, that has ever lived or ever will live. He feels the weight of all that. You talk about a big storm. You talk about a storm where you get wet. Talk about a storm where you feel like you're drowning. Talk about a storm that, that pushes him to the place where he says, my father, why have you forsaken me? And yet faces that storm. So that we never have to face that particular storm with all those pieces together. In the process of believing better about Jesus, we believe better about ourselves. Because while you may have been sold a lot of stuff growing up of all the potential, rarely does anybody ever get to live out all the dreams they ever had. And sometimes it's not about living out those dreams. Sometimes it's about readjusting those dreams. Sometimes it's about seeing a better dream than all those dreams you had growing up. Because growing up, I wanted to be a big-time wrestler. <laughs> oh, yeah, baby. <laughs> and I'm glad that that dream has not fulfilled and not worked out. Because wrestling today is much different from the 70s and early 80s when I was all into it. But, but I just want you to understand that, that there is ways to engage in this thing, to engage that truth. And to be, be comfortable with being uncomfortable. And lastly, to allow God to stretch you. To stretch you and in the process to wreck you in order to heal you.
See, sometimes you want God to heal us without any more kind of, any, any kind of stuff going on. But you cannot be healed from something that you are not or don't have happen. You can't heal from a broken bone if your bone hasn't been broken. And maybe this is the year that God stretches you. Maybe this is the year that God wrecks you. But he's doing it for your good because he wants to get to a place where he can heal you. And those of you in the medical profession know sometimes you've got to do some damage to make stuff better. You know, you get in there and you mess around with those cuts and you make them worse. You know, re-break a bone because it wasn't set right. But in order to get it right, sometimes you have to redo it. See, it's not the quality of your faith that saves you. It's the object of that faith. And in my mind, Paul, as he writes this book of, of Hebrews, captures it most clearly when he simply says these words. Let us look only to Jesus. Only to Jesus, the one who began, that is the pioneer and founder of our faith, and who makes it perfect, who completes us. Let us look to Jesus, the one who started this thing in our lives, and the one who takes responsibility for finishing it in our lives. Again, it's not about our faith. It's about what our faith is, the object of our faith. He, talking about Jesus, he endured the cross, accepting the shame as if it were nothing because of the joy that lay ahead for him. And you know what that joy is? It's you. And it's you, and it's you, and it's you. It's even all of you right here. That's what pushed Jesus through facing the greatest storm anybody will ever have to face. The joy to know that there are times that he can stand up in our lives and say, quiet, be still, and that happens in our life. Those moments when he can seem to come out of a slumber, when he has been as wet as we're wet, to remind us that he is there with us going through that.